My name is Carl Horvath. I'm president of Campus Consortium. And today I have a great panel of guests that are doing wonderful things for the education industry. And we'll be hearing from each of them and they will give us their perspective on what technology can do to make your institution a success, your program a success, serve uh, students of the future to serve students of today there's some changes that we have to make. The need for this transformation, which is, uh, of course, uh, employer needs, how students work differently and communicate differently than students of the past, big emphasis on digital diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, who can access technology and who can't, in addition to the access issues, as well as customization and social media and how students interact with academics and student services. I would encourage everyone, all the institutions here, to not look at ed tech vendors as vendors solely, you really need to evaluate them as a partner. Technology dependency is key and finding the right people to work with and diving a little deeper in who you work with is very important. Some ed tech innovators in the ed tech sector today, you will look at this list and maybe you'll see some people you recognize, authors, presenters, evangelists. I would like to introduce our first panelists and uh, thank you for joining. Alicia Sepulveda, she is a person who is the chief operating officer for Wildflower Education. Focus on different trends that I've been seeing um, specifically in my work as an academic coach throughout my time um, for about 12 years, as well as um, as an adjunct instructor at University of Colorado Boulder. So these are the four trends that I'm really seeing. This is really rooted in my, in my experience with students and in student engagement. Um, so the first one is really focused on loneliness and sense of belonging. And this is something we've always talked about sense of belonging in the university and college setting. But really what I'm seeing, and, and really we've seen this in data as well in reports pre-pandemic as well as currently, where students are incredibly lonely. And I actually shared a couple statistics in my class. It was my first class um, in January that I was teaching with, uh, with students in person. And I just shared some of these statistics and some of the students were just like, mm-hmm, yep, I'm seeing that too. Like they were all just really resonating with that, that sense of loneliness. But I really believe we have to figure out how we can leverage technology to actually solve this problem. It's such a critical need for our students. Um, the second trend that I'm seeing is that we really do learn better together. Uh, I think having, you know, group projects and really helping students connect in the class, but towards a shared goal. But we talk about the importance of networking and introducing yourself to other people. But really, this also creates a sense of belonging in my class. But we know that students aren't doing this naturally. And so how do we leverage technology to help them connect easier and make this a little bit more seamless? Um, the third trend that I'm really seeing is around jobs for the future. And this is a really big passion area of mine because uh, what I'm seeing is that students just don't even know that many of these jobs, these new jobs exist. So I'm, what I'm thinking about is, for example, artificial intelligence or a lot of climate technology that's happening. These are huge industries that are going to be such a huge priority in the next three to five to 10 years. The other connection with jobs to the future is really thinking about what are some jobs that are just in high demand. So maybe they've been around for forever. Uh, but really, we're seeing a very uh, you know, low um, interest in these. So how do we actually make those uh, types of jobs and roles interesting to learners in a new um, and interesting way? My last trend that we're seeing, and this is really just rooted in students are long, long, really longing that connection and hope. Um, and what I've seen with students is that once they get connected to something that they actually care about or that they, they're working towards a goal that they have in mind, that they do have a sense of hope for the future. And if you've talked to a student recently, they're not, they're not, <laughs> they're kind of losing hope in a lot of areas, um, culturally, right, societally. Um, there's a lot of problems in our world, but when they start to see themselves as a problem solver and that they can actually make change, even in a small way, I think it really facilitates hope. And what I'm really seeing is that when students get connected to that, they're able to have that hope and, and work towards that future. This is uh, Greg M. Smith. Greg's career as a technology leader, he's been around for a while, a couple decades. He's got a lot of experience with transformational education projects. And he was the former CTO of University of Maryland University College. Over the past several years, we've seen kind of magnification of some issues that have existed prior to the pandemic. So 
As we talk about education access or access to education or even technology, there's kind of several core pieces that uh, come to mind as challenges and that we saw exacerbated by the pandemic. First, first and foremost is cost. So students are you know, challenged with the cost of education in general, but then also the associated tools necessary to take part in classes. So you have students who may be interested in things like video game design that can't compete with other students because of what they're, you know, kind of coming to the table with in terms of rural areas where it may not have high-speed internet. Um, students with disabilities is a area that's it's significantly overlooked when we're talking about access for, for technology in general. And then we have inadequate infrastructures along the, on, along the kind of campus environments to support the, the transition in the way students are learning on in a campus, there's no longer going to the computer lab. When we were when we were in college, we would go to a computer lab with 30 or 40 or 50 machines. Now this is done in the classroom in real time. Laptops exist in the lectures and the in the labs, and they need to be able to have the infrastructure to support that. Universities, what we've seen is there's a very strong concern and 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 trend around cybersecurity and addressing cybersecurity issues, whether that's student data, whether that's access to campus networks. Universities tend to be strapped for overall operating budgets and you wind up with machines and um, services and platforms that are obsolete simply because it, there's not a not a budget or not a funding to, method to be able to kind of replace and keep up with the kind of latest and greatest is what the students will see when they graduate. So kind of these five areas have had a significant impact on the overall access to learning resources at all spectrums of uh, those kind of socioeconomic status. I'd like to introduce Jim Mazarakis. He is the Chief Operating Officer of On System Logic, and he's a seasoned IT professional. Educational transformation is similar to every other transformation we've been seeing in the last few years, whether it's business transformation, banking transformation, customer service transformation, work transformation, entertainment, restaurants. So all of these transformations have led to much more digital platforms than we have ever seen before. And unfortunately, some challenges as well. Those challenges are uh, malware, phishing attacks, spyware, ransomware. And every year, you see the statistics here, in just one year, 50% increase in the total number of some of these attacks. Existing solutions uh, have a big challenge. And their challenge is that many of the companies that are providing these solutions gain the largest amount of their revenue from restoration of your environment. So once you get penetrated and you have malware, they come in and they clean it, they restore your environment. It may take weeks or months, you may lose some information, but the majority of their money is not made by selling you a prevention, it's selling you restoration. The challenge is that 450,000 new malware samples are registered each day. That is a phenomenal number, and there is no way that past information can always be used effectively against that. So the approach that we have taken is rather than looking what has happened before and pre presenting you with a solution, we are actually looking at how your software behaves when it's healthy. We create an AI map of that, and then we prevent that software from acting in a malicious way by being subverted by malware actors. So that is a very important difference. And it's the key thing that we would suggest to people to do is to add an additional layer of protection. So you're not throwing away what you have today. Now, if you do nothing else to your environment, I would recommend that you patch as soon as possible all of your endpoints and your servers. So if you do nothing else but patching, that is the most effective solution. Um, our largest uh, customer today is University of Maryland with more than 3,000 endpoints that we protect. And we also monitor those endpoints as part of the service that we provide. Our next panelist, Nate Hurst, who is Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of Active Class. You know, we think a lot uh, at Active Class about the disparity between consumer technologies, especially social media, I and mean, what we're all used to, not just young students, right? It's the middle-aged guys, too, that uh, also use social media a lot. Um, and when you compare and contrast the functionality and usability and uh, even the UX and the beauty of those products um, and the simplicity of them and 
and the, the amount of attention they capture. And, you know, there's a, there's a big gap in our view of what, what they offer versus what a lot of our students are experiencing inside of, you know, education technology. We can do a lot better um, in terms of what we're offering to our students and, and to our instructor and getting to parity with what consumer or B2B technologies offer and having, you know, a closer match inside of, of ed provide a social media like layer to your to your LMSs to give students and instructors easier ways of communicating with each other, checking in on one another building community, making friends. Our vision and our thought is that it's really, it's, it's upon the instructor to help facilitate and create a lot of that engagement, right? Students aren't going to naturally join in in conversation and make friends uh, without somebody guiding them and helping them along the way. And so we want to make it easy for instructors to create those communities and create that dialogue and ensure that they are kind of the quote unquote, the influencer of their classroom, the star of their classroom, right? There, there's, you know, any number of uh, influencers out there in today's social media landscape, they have a lot of power at their fingertips and a lot of tools to create and share and engage their audience. And we think instructors need a lot of those same tools. If you're a YouTuber or you're a tic on TikTok or any of the social media platforms, guess what you have to do to go live and, to, and, and engage with the audience? You hit one button and you're live and you're engaging with your audience members. So that's how we like to think about it. We have part of our solution is to make that simpler, that experience. So if you want to go live and conference with your students or, or have a recording of that, uh, of that lecture or office hours, then be posted to a social media like feed. There's a, to me, there's a huge distinction. And I hope we can all agree on this point that there's a big distinction between what learning is and what education is. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that edu you, know, you can't have education without following an expert, right? It's gotta be accredited, of course, as we all know, but that expert is the instructor. And so we wanna put the instructor back at the center of their classroom, make it easy for them to kind of be that, again, quote unquote, be that influencer of their classroom and really have their students be their followers. And we feel like we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. We're able to actually get in that learner mindset and, and be more successful. Brian Ellison, who is at the California Community College System, a previously tenured instructor, senior level administrator. I began in the community college industry many, many years ago. I, I actually still work in the industry as a uh, vice president of student services now for a community college in Southern California. And so the discussion up to this point has really resonated with me on that particular basis. You know, the the things that, that I'm looking for, for in terms of technology in a community college environment right now, probably my two most important issues, and this might resonate with our audience, is how can I incorporate technology into my efforts regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and anti-discrimination? How can I use the technology that I currently have, or what sort of technology do I need to, to bring into the campus environment to, to move those items forward so that I'm creating not only within the classroom environment, a welcoming environment that, that includes those elements, but also just campus-wide and also in terms of our, our social media presence and the way, the way that we introduce ourselves to our prospective students. And so that to me is really important. The other way that I look at technology as a vice president is how can I use the technology I have or what do I need to increase my enrollment? and my retention rates, because, you know, I think this is sort of a national phenomenon, but certainly in California, the community college system took a, a major uh, hit in terms of declining enrollment. And actually that is pre-pandemic, uh, uh, it's a pre-pandemic phenomenon. So we were in decline prior to, to 2020, and now uh, with, subsequent to, to the pandemic and COVID, uh, we, we are still experiencing um, some real declines in enrollment. So how can I use technology at this point to reverse that trend line. I was always interested in the non-credit and contract ed piece of community college work. You know, I think everyone's very familiar with the credit operation. These are the traditional courses that we offer for students that are intent on transferring to a four-year institution. But the non-credit piece and the contract ed piece are much more uh, CTE driven. They're much more involved with short-term strategies to provide skill sets to students. They get them into employment situations quick. They also are used for upskilling. And then lastly, uh, to some extent, small business ownerships, adults from probably the ages of 19 to say 45 that are looking for either new skill sets, they're looking for entry into the labor market, maybe they're career changers, or um, they're looking to become entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs of small business owners. And so that's really what BYU's learning is all about. It's an effort to try to provide through an online learning experience, 
the skill sets that folks need to make that transition. Student professional personal goals, we're trying to address those in a high touch online environment. Skill sets, as I mentioned, leading to employment uh, and, and really short term uh, learning strategies, not courses running a traditional 16 or 18 week semester. You're all creative innovators and leaders in this space. Thank you, attendees. Thank you to the Campus Consortium team who's here every webinar, uh, quietly working in the background. And thank you to the five great presenters and technology leaders that were here today. Really appreciate your time, Alicia, Greg, Jim, Nate, and Brian. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day.